Hello, welcome back to this special upload on the Public Relations Podcast feed. This is episode two of the pilot shows for Comms Question Time. And on this one, Kathleen Lucente and Jim McCarthy, who appeared again at Short Notice, tackle two more questions from listeners, Comms Questions, and we discuss how we could approach actually solving those problems ourselves. So I hope you find this second episode interesting too. There are three episodes and the third one's coming up in a moment. Have you set your marketing budget for 2025 yet? Is there a comms component? Why am I asking? Because we all know the world of business or running an organization today operates in a noisy environment. Advertising is less effective than it was. People are being bombarded with more marketing than ever, and it's only going to get worse. Plus, there always seems to be someone ready to criticize your organization or even damage your own professional reputation these days. So... How do you reach people today? How do you reach them on a deep emotional level, not just for a few seconds? How do you turn them into the most powerful word of mouth marketers you can think of? How do you ensure your side of the story is being heard? The answer is PR and comms, but not the PR you might think of from the past. This isn't about people who push out a thousand press releases or get you some coverage in some obscure magazine once a month. This is PR for the new era of marketing one where the practitioners are weaving narratives into people's lives today. And in each episode of this show, I gather together some of the best independent agencies and practitioners of this from around the world. And together, we come up with action plans for your real-world situations and scenarios. You ask the questions, the panel comes up with an action plan for you. So welcome then to Comms Question Time, episode two. Let me introduce my panel today very quickly. I'm going to ask them to give their two-sentence description of who they are, their organization, and what they specialize in. And firstly, a very uh, good morning, or is it good evening to you, Kathleen Lucente from Red Bank Communications in Texas. Good to be here. Yes, it is evening, but I'm bright and bushy-tailed even at 9 p.m. So uh, I'm Kathleen Lucente. I'm the CEO and founder of Red Fan Communications. We are a corporate communications and B2B tech PR firm out of Austin, Texas, with clients all across the country, as far as Israel and Costa Rica and beyond. So happy to be here. Wonderful. Thank you very much. And also huge thanks for standing in at short notice once again, Jim McCarthy from Counterpoint Strategies, who joined us in episode one as well, who's uh, currently near New York. Jim, tell us about yourself. Uh, Well, thanks for having me, Richard. Uh, I'm Jim McCarthy. I'm the president at Counterpoint Strategies. We're a boutique issues and crisis management agency based in uh, New York and Washington, D.C. And we advise leading private equity firms, large cap industrial companies, and a variety of trade associations on how to navigate adversity in the public discourse. Okay. That sum, sums up what Jim does, taking on the clients that others tend to shy away from. He has no fear, this man. <laughs> yeah. And he's going to be fascinating in this show as well, along with Kathleen. Introducing myself very quickly, I'm Richard Midson. I'm a former radio news broadcaster and journalist, public relations officer, and now I'm a, a podcast journalist covering communications in a show called The Public Relations Podcast. And by the way, if you would like to speak to any of the panelists in any of these shows, and the details will be on the screen and on the website at the website commsquestiontime.com, and they will obviously be delighted to hear from you. And particularly if they can help you as well. So let's get started with our two scenarios for today. And the first one is actually near to me at home here in Australia, because it was someone I actually met at an event the other day who asked this question for the panel. And we have an entrepreneur who is asking the panel this. They are setting up a business to import Mexican drinking chocolate into Australia. The product has a high percentage of cocoa and is sweetened with natural sugar cane. There's no problem with the product. People love it. The problem is getting it noticed in a busy market. So far, they plan to focus on food festivals and social media, but they know that it could be hard to gain traction. They see the health benefits as one of the big selling points. Drinking chocolate, they say, gives you a morning lift because it's a stimulant, but doesn't give you the hypertension the coffee can. They say that, at least. They also want to promote the idea, they told me, of having this character that they will put on the front of their packaging, which looks like a sort of black and white character of a Mexican male who is, in fact, the owner of the company. They have just two people involved in the company so far. They think they've got a great product. I actually tried it. It is pretty amazing. They know they need to get their story out, though, but they don't quite know what story to tell. If it all goes well, they want to expand the team, of course, and their business rapidly. But can the panel help? What story can they be telling? So far, they're talking about just doing social media. They don't really have a story in mind. They just think they should. And they're also thinking about going along to food festivals, but they're not quite sure what to do there beyond just letting people try it. 
My biggest problem with this from a, from a story point of view is that there isn't a story so far. It's just chocolate. Well, drinking chocolate is always nice when you have a quick sip of it. There's, there's nothing standing out. My, my thought myself was this health angle was going on on this angle of almost making there's a competition against coffee, maybe, or something like that. But what's the panel thing? Let's start with you, Kathleen. What's, what's your first thoughts on this before we actually try and work out a plan? I mean, I think that, you know, the chocolate, I mean, there's a history of chocolate in Mexico, right? And, and, and there's a, you know, where it's come from. So you really, you know, a lot of people don't even realize that, that that is sort of the origin story of chocolate. And I think if you want to romance people with chocolate, you need to kind of really dig in. So a, a strong narrative does need to be told to bring this story together. And I use the example, we we have a client here in Austin, Texas, that is now a darling in the Food and Wine magazine. We've helped them win awards. It's a client I normally don't take on, but because I felt like the CEO had such, and the founder had such an incredible narrative, it was around Masa. It was around telling the story of Masa. Now, keep in mind, I'm in Austin, Texas. There's a lot of Mexican restaurants, but this is now the number one restaurant that people are traveling across the country for. We spent a lot of time putting together the narrative and then making sure we talk to influencers and getting them in from all over the country to really experience it. So if I were launching this, a couple of things I would think about would be, first of all, I'd be thinking about the weather in Australia. Number one, hot, that's a hot product. So is there a cold version of this and some kind of a mm -hmm. drink as well? If you are going to launch it, where are you launching it? I have done my research. There's not that many Mexican restaurants, by the way, in Australia in, in general. No. So I was thinking about partnerships that they might want to have. Mm -hmm. So in, I think probably putting together a very strong narrative, having baskets that are sent out to influencers, social media influencers to begin with, with tasting, getting to meet the character, the founder, and doing some tasting sessions. So, so what do you think good. the narrative should actually be, Kathleen? I mean, it's, it, you talk about the kind of story of it, but it, it kind of feels to me a bit with chocolate that we've heard these sort of stories before. We've heard of the Aztec, yeah. we've heard of stuff like this. So it's, probably, it's like, what, what was working with your client, do you think, that makes it stand out? It's this idea that, it, interestingly enough, the production of masa in the United States and even in Mexico, a lot of people don't, aren't allowed to even go in the factories to see how masa is actually made, the different types of masa. Same thing with chocolate. So chocolate that's really, really um, healthy. We have another company who has chocolate that's infused with blueberries, a half a cup of blueberries with antioxidants. When we sold that chocolate, we had to tell the romance of the story and the health benefit was just an, an additive. It wasn't the number one, the thing that drove people. So that's a really, you know, I think that you have to dig into the founder. What, what, why did he start this company? What's interesting about it? Is there a cocoa farm that's like, that they're associated with? Now, if none of that exists, now we have to go a different angle. But I would still really try to dig in to see you know, are the photos, all of those types of things. I'm in the process of doing, launching a farm in Costa Rica. That's a cannabis farm. And I'm doing it from Austin, Texas. I'm, I'm putting that entire website together with real photos, meeting those farmers, really telling the story of how they came together. And then if there's a nonprofit angle going back, but it is a, it is a tough sell because you're looking at a climate that is uh, warm. You're bringing a warm product in. You can look at partnerships like coffee. Maybe there's a coffee chain across Australia to you could partner with. You could also look at what's already being imported from Mexico to, mm -hmm. and can, what can you do for bringing Mexico to Australia that's bigger than just the cocoa itself. So, so it sounds like it sounds chain. like the the real angle you're trying to go on here is the human angle of the people, where it's coming from, the 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 farm, the 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 sort of cultural feeling of it. You're you're buying into an image of. Mexican life of Mexican chocolate sort of thing, yeah? I think, well, because they specifically, and of course there's many things that we don't know yet, mm. and it, I would have to dig deeper, but because they're also putting the character of, this, of the founder on the, on, the, on the packaging, it begs the question of what, why did he start this? What is, mm. what is his family history? What is the connection? I think there's a couple of famous people in Australia that are, that are, are Mexican-Australians. You've got singers that are um, famous that are in yeah. the hip hop, believe it, genre. You've got artists that are located. So there's some interesting partnerships. You even have a heavyweight champion, a female boxer in Australia. So you know more you know, about it. Connections would be really interesting. And then of course, there's the foodie connections as well yeah. that are people who are not from Mexico at all, but are in Australia. 
that would want to get a basket that's very photographable. And that's where you would lead up to what the launch is. I know they're talking about doing things that there's food a lot festivals. of food type events. Yeah. And I would try to look at that. I would also look at uh, tequila and mezcal, which are imported. And I'd start looking at, you know, what are the, some partnerships you could be doing there? Maybe there mm. is a... I think, I think I think one of the problems they've got at the moment is that is they feel quite small because it's just the two of them. And, right. you know, it is a very small little enterprise that they've just started going on. And so they don't feel that they've kind of got the clout and that's kind of trying to grab that attention and giving them something. I mean, let me bring Jim in just so we can kind yeah, of discuss it. it as a whole. I mean, what's your first thoughts on the story, on the narrative? I think this well, humanizing it, thing's quite oh, quite good. It is. And, and although I'm a little, I'm a little troubled about the idea that they're orienting it around the founder, you know, CEO. And I, you know, I've seen a lot of companies try to do that. And often it gets tied up in that person's own self-regard and their image, maybe even their ego a little bit. And that can, that can kind of wrench what ought to be a branding, glamorizing enterprise into a personalized vanity so you're uh, saying, how marketable uh, is that person? Are they relatable? Right, right, they yeah. Do they come across well? Yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. And, and you know, it doesn't always work. Sometimes it does, but it doesn't always work. It comes with a lot of risks. But I do think the idea of crafting a, an origin story is hugely important. Mm -hmm. Although a really critical ingredient, I think, is the idea of glamour. You know, there's a, there's a, a indicator I think about a lot in these kinds of things named Virginia Postrel, P-O-S-T-R-E-L, very deep philosophical thinker. She wrote a great book called The Power of Glamour, Longing and the Art of Visual Persuasion. And it's all about how con connecting and commercial communications must be about glamour in some way. Now, I don't mean wearing diamonds at a movie premiere. That's kind of a, that's, that's a, a caricatured idea of what glamour is. Glamour is really about aspiration hmm. and longing and desire. And they need to create a mystique around the product that contains those elements. A lot of that is, it has to be visually appealing. Sometimes that means it should be beautiful or aspirational. Mm. I mean, the first thing I would tell them is, you know, craft the narrative. What is the, what is the, what is the nature of this product? To, to my ears, it sounds sophisticated. It sounds cosmopolitan. It mm. sounds like something aristocratic people in Mexico might do in the morning when they have their coffee or even French people, I think, yeah, take chocolate uh, as a beverage in, in the morning. <laughs> Tap into those ideas and create a story about why and how and for how long people have been using the beverage in that milieu. And that... Oh, sorry, Kathleen, were you just going to say something in, on that last point? No, I, I agree with him. I think there's something really interesting. We had a chocolate company that came to us and their chocolates were sumptuous. Mm. They were gorgeous. And I think I mentioned to you, they were, people were paying, they had ganache in the center of them. Their website, unfortunately, looked like a very low class brand when they came oh. to us. Mm. And we said to them, we actually had experts come in. We did a full brand positioning. We, we, we came up with all the different language, like kind of what you're talking about. And then we repackaged it almost looked like Hermé. And, and, and we actually had a seasonal band that went around the box. We also brought it Great. to the ballet and when the ballet was having their big events, we were serving it with beautiful, you know, people serving uh -huh. it and yep. people started looking for it and asking for it. And so we also had it personally delivered to a number of people's homes to get them excited and those types of things. So I, I agree. I mean, that's why the, the issue about the face is forcing this idea, like which way are we going to go? So there's branding. But you usually start with the narrative and the brand positioning before you start to do the packaging. Well, that, that's my concern at the moment is that they've done yeah. the packaging. They put his face on the front of it, but they haven't actually thought about the story that they're going to tell behind it. Right. And it's like, yeah. well, you don't want to just tell the idea of some guy who's trying to bring chocolate to Australia. That's a boring story. That's an entrepreneur. Well, it's you, one you person that's Johnny Appleseed, got, Like you right? were saying earlier, it's humanity. It's that farm and whatever like that. Yeah. But I mean, yeah. I am, I'm a bit concerned that they're going to get lost in the noise with this. And th this is why yeah. I, I wondered about this angle of the kind of the chocolate versus coffee thing, which was something that struck me when I was talking to him. And he was well, saying that, I mean, I don't know whether there's any science or any research behind this, and you can't really claim it if you haven't got something to back it up. But whether there is an angle of going in there and saying, look, this could be your alternative drink. And maybe that would appeal to your kind of your daytime TVs, your your your, your fluffy magazine-y type stories. I, I wonder could. if there's something. I mean, 
You know, it, how do you give it that edge? What, what, what do we think? Well, you have to look at, I think there's a couple of things. When you look at coffee, they have to actually do some research on there's coffee and then what are the alternatives? I like what you were talking about, Jim, in terms of like the the French mystique and the the sexiness of that, right? That's That gives people, you want people to think like, oh yeah, I want to be like that. I want to be like right. that, right? Emily in Paris kind of, you know, type thing, right? And so if you could, you know, the imagery that goes with the brand, everything then has to go with that storyline. Even the influencers you then pick, you would want them to be people who are willing to get their photograph taken. You know, they've opened the package, they've, you know, they're experiencing it and they get all kind of excited about it. That's going to be, that's going to be important. So that the man's face is going to not necessarily jive with that. That the other thing is you have to go all the way back to what are the other things that are that, that are being put out in the market right now? Mushroom coffee is being put out. That's a huge. There's a huge brand on that right now as an alternative for coffee. It's supposed to have way more, you know, healthy ingredients in there. And the other one is matcha, matcha with also mushrooms infused in it. This is actually taking the market by, you know, people are going wild over this. That's a healthy push, not a sexy push, just FYI. It's more of a crunchy, you know, you're going to be a hipster, but not sophisticated. Yeah. Okay? So they've got to be clear on their story. I think in a way, that's the very first thing they've got to do, isn't it? They've yeah. got to decide which story and, create, and, and create, stick with it. And create an actual narrative. It could be mm. a written prose story, or guess what? It could be a graphic novel is kind of what I'm imagining. Mm. There's a beautiful graphic novel that just came out about Empress Carlotta of Mexico. Gorgeous drawings with the French Lynn Claire style. Beautiful. And it's a, it's a beautiful story, really visually engaging. Mm -hmm. And I've seen two different campaigns in just the last year use graphic novel to engage mm. in issues. One was about very dry economic subject, about FDR's policies during the years after the Great Depression. And you couldn't think of a more dull topic and yet in graphic novel form the headlock the book is called the forgotten man by amity schlaze it is so gripping and engaging and it was released in serialized form on social media so people got involved in the story followed it it gathered a center of gravity mm -hmm. and then a, a, a publication i work with called pluribus just did a terrific graphic novel about frederick Douglass and the origins of the free speech movement in the Civil War and the, and the, the years of, of, of Reconstruction after slavery. Again, super dry historical topic, but in graphic novel format, it's like, it's like candy. But this, this is like the whole Hamilton. I saw Hamilton for the first time the other day and I was absolutely exactly. blown. I mean, I'm not suggesting that, that they set up their own musical I, just to promote some that. chocolate, but, but it's that point, isn't it? It's telling the well, human story behind they need a, the dry right. thing. It could Definitely. be the history of it. It could be why it's sophisticated. It could be distinctive people who have taken chocolate beverage in the morning throughout history. There's all kinds of ways you can create little stories, but they need to sit down, spend time and write that narrative and then compose it. They could also use photography too. If you got a really top-notch photographer and said, I want to infuse the idea of glamour into the way people are and longing and desire into the way people are using this beverage, that's a whole great theme for a photography excuse me, photographic series. So they've got to construct that first. And I've got some ideas on how to, on how to boost the marketing, but the story must come before all else. I was going to say, so let, let's talk about that marketing bit. So let's say they've come up with a story now. How are they going to get it out there? Kathy, you said about influencers in particular. Well, I mean, I think also you, what I'm, they have to have a business plan, right? So we want to yeah. know what's the business plan? What's the, how much are they able to produce? Are they, you know, are, is the goal to be in, you know, supermarkets is the goal to be, they said originally being in sort of farm stands and, and, and sort of, but there are some more highbrow. If we start to go back to the narrative, we start to think, is that really the right place to be? Because that kind of does not match anymore, yeah. right? So now you have to say, okay, well, what, what are the right partners, you know, and who can help give us the, the reach and so that's another, you know, thing. There should be, you know, some incredible marketing around maybe that they create sort of their own cafe in the middle of a city and they actually have sort of a, you know, it's a pop-up cafe yeah. where, you know, all sorts of elegant people are sitting around drinking chocolate. It may be m mapping to some interesting stories with the marketing that you were just talking about. So like this, you know, this is kind of where you have to capture that image and get people saying, oh, I want to be like that sort of yeah. Thinking about, you know, and and, and the, you have to think about which cities are you going to launch in. I mean, they have two employees, right? So yeah, they so have far, to yeah. have partners, right? They're going to have to have 
some level of a partnership. And there could be a coffee partner that is looking for an excuse mm -hmm. to, you know, have a, maybe it's a takeover, you know, type yeah. thing where they already have a following and they're, you know, they'll take some, some money out of the lead, but they're willing to start carrying the product after after that and create that kind of spark yeah but to create the narrative and get that story going J jim what, how do you think it should market i love kathleen's idea of, of incubating within a larger beverage company i think that's really cool and you see a lot of clothing retailers doing that where specific designers will do a line within say brooks brothers or j presses you know existing overarching brands so i think that's got a lot of merit and probably turbo boost them but it's also making me think of a, an event we did some years ago for, uh, you'll like this, Richard, for the first genetically modified food, which was the Flavor Saver Tomato. And as you can imagine, people were a little leery of it. It was a startup brand. And so what we did was we set up a, we set up a chefs at the U.S. Capitol building in Washington, D.C. and had them serve all kinds of different tomato recipes to congressional staffers. But the good part, the, the you know, the deep comms insight here is that these are the most intelligent, best looking cream of the crop, young people in America with, you know, Colgate smiles and Benetton diversity. And they're all eating our flavor saver tomato bruschetta and our spaghetti and our flavor saver pizza. And we took photographs and videos and we got testimonials and that was a, and we, we harvested all that content, used it for six months thereafter, again, with like the best looking, most glamorous young people in America. And that was a, an easy to set up one day turnkey event that, that yielded us an enormous amount of publicity in that world of DC politics, visual images. So they could easily find with a little brainstorming, I think, an event that was happening in the morning, let's say, with young people. I mean, there's there's a lot of ways to, yeah. you know, to to latch on to an, a, a locale or an occurrence or an event that 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 lets you gather all that material and, and kind of piggyback on an existing media ecosystem we, we've yeah, got so much stuff here so if we're trying to draw this into a plan i mean the, the first thing i've got here is that you've got to sort out your story you've got to decide what it is and basically write a narrative don't just sort of write one line or we're, we're going to be mexican chocolate well what what's the human yeah. side of it as kathleen was saying what's what's the stories as jim was saying as well then it's about getting it out there and we were talking well we mentioned influencers first but then we said well is that actually sending the right message is that reaching the right people? In which case, with the number of people involved in the business, we're talking about coming up with partnerships, coffee chains or, or something like that, or events or, or yeah. pop-ups that you can actually latch onto as well. Making sure then that I've got down here about the website as well. It's making sure things like that actually match the story that you're trying to put out. It's not just a website. It is a clear statement of the brand. Making sure that the people that are seen consuming this, if you're going for the sexier brand, you're making sure that the people who are being seen doing this are, aren't just turning up in, in their hoodie with a bit of food splattered down it. They're turning up in nice clothes. So it's, it's all that sort of stuff. So what, what would be the next thing they should do? It is to come up with a clear narrative, isn't it? Absolutely. Absolutely. And that, that clear narrative is not just the narrative. It's, it's who's the target audience. Like, you yeah. know, they don't, you know, they want to kind of imagine like what age group are they going after? Who's going into, if it's the partnership of the coffee shop, they have to come up with an entire deck to woo that coffee shop into believing that this is a win-win partnership for both of them, right? And so that's super, super important. I do think that there probably is some influencer work they can do leading up to that to, to get that coffee shop on board, right? So you don't want to go from zero to nothing to try to create that partnership. You need to kind of start to kind of figure that out and see, see, you know, kind of create some anticipation, if you will. Yeah. And some social um, validation. That's important. Yeah. Their packaging, unfortunately, what, packaging is a really big challenge. I'm seeing often, and I'm sure you've seen this as well. Companies come into a communications firm looking for help and they're, they think they're ready. Mm -hmm. And we, we, you realize that they're completely not. So they might have to say, this is our starter package, but our plan is to move it since they already have packaging and their expense has already been uh, done. There are some incredible packaging companies nowadays that make it possible for you to be more nimble, but still be luxurious. And so they need to kind of tap into that so they can also do seasonal. Maybe there's something around the holidays, around, around Christmas, those types of things to keep it fresh because otherwise it's just a one-time thing. Fantastic. Well, we've got some great ideas in there and it just shows as well that comms is far more 
as I said right in my introduction at the beginning, that it's not just sending out press releases. It's about the whole thing these days, about weaving a narrative into every aspect of what you're doing. What's coming up next? The second scenario we've got today is what you do if your own reputation is called into question by journalists. It could potentially happen to anyone, particularly if you're in a high-profile role. That's coming up next. A quick reminder that if you would like to put a scenario or a question to the panel, mm -hmm. which comes question time, and there are two ways to do that. Either go to commsquestiontime.com, that's commsquestiontime.com, and fill out the form on the homepage there. Or you can always reach out to me on LinkedIn under the name Richard Midson as well. That's M-I-D-S-O-N. And maybe I'll meet you at an event as well, or any of my panelists might meet you at an event, and we can bring it on to the show as well. And if you'd like to reach out also directly to one of the panelists today, then you can see the details for Kathleen and for Jim under their uh, their video right now, and you will find their details on the website as well. So if you would like to work with them or uh, discuss more ideas with them, then of course they would be delighted to talk to you. So time now for one focused on crisis cons, but for an individual. And to avoid identifying this person in the scenario, I've changed a lot of the details here, but the, the main thing is still there. A figure used to work for a major scientific organization. A second figure also used to work there, but was let go for an unspecified reason. Recently, the second person started collaborating with a reporter on a story claiming that the organization's research standards were poor. Our client wasn't responsible for the standards, but did have a senior management role. They're concerned that while the accusations may not be directed directly at them, their reputation could still be damaged simply through association. The reporter has been trying to contact them to gain more background for the story. So far, they've ignored the reporter's approaches, but fear their name could come up out of context if they don't cooperate. What should they do to protect their reputation now? And if a story is released, that points a finger at them. What should they do? Jim, I'm going to start with you on this one, just because you, you seem to deal with clients like this, this quite a bit. You've taken on some really tough yeah. clients. So let's start with you. I mean, what, what's the first thing they should be doing in the position that they're, they're sitting there at home right now and they're going, oh gosh, what do I do? A uh, couple things. First off, the, the instincts to hide under the desk and try to ignore the reporter and the hope that it goes away is going to be a very powerful impulse. And it's probably something that they'll hear from friends and confidants that they turn to for advice or input. But that is actually the riskiest course of action. And what's more, reporters, journalists have an instinct for that. And they, they can smell that fear. Not only that, they'll use it against you. They'll use the fear you have of being exposed as a means to, you know, provoke you into response, to leverage you to say more than you otherwise would have or ought to. And they'll predate on, on you if they sense that's what's going on. And like not returning their phone calls, that's a pretty big red mm. gate to wave. Yeah. So the first thing I would suggest is you got to write down, again, your, your own story. What are the facts? What happened in the situation? Even if you're never going to light it up publicly, get all those facts down in front of you, especially the ones that mitigate or distinguish you from, you know, the wrongdoing or the malfeasance. So have all those facts ready at, at, at your command. The second thing I would do is contact the reporter. It sounds counterintuitive, but grab them by the lapels. And here's the crucial step. You must document all interaction you have with that reporter. I often tell reporters, I record every phone call I have with every journalist, and I tell them right at the top, I'm recording this conversation for accuracy. And that puts them on notice that you know what you're doing, that you're going to hold them accountable. They can't cut corners and they can't color outside the lines. And shoot them straight and say, listen, I'm very concerned that you're going to get the wrong idea here that... You know, I, I took some part mm -hmm. in what you seem to think was, you know, wrong, wrongdoing. I want to tell you that's not, not the case. Again, state it up front, document it, follow it up in writing with a note to them and the editor. And, and also, Richard, crucially, tell them if you get it wrong, I'm going to do something about it. I'm not going to sit still for, you know, any former colleagues disparaging me or you guys distorting what I did. So warn them that you'll do something about it. And when you take all those measures, it lets the publication and the journalists know that they can't, you know, just paint you in caricature. So those are the first several steps I would suggest. I, I, th I think one of the thoughts immediately is that, as you, you said at the beginning, is that people are going to be afraid, aren't they? And that yeah. having that confidence, particularly if you've not dealt with journalists before, and going yeah. in there and being confident and saying, I'm going to do all this, I'm going to document this and stuff like that. Most people, as you say, are, are likely to just hide, aren't they? So... I mean, in a way, should they be bringing in a PR person to represent them? Because, I mean, 
as a journal as an ex journalist, if I hear from yeah. a PR person, not them, I'm going to be more suspicious as well. Yeah, um, I, you you but, can, but if it, it's got to be the right sort of PR person. I mean, my, my I my my great chagrin about our our industry, uh, Richard, is that so many public relations agents want to find ways to conciliate and cooperate and engage with journalists. And that's not what's happening here. The, the, your, the, the individual's role and the, his, agent's, his or her agent's role is to make sure anything that comes out is accurate mm -hmm. and that is factual and that does not distort that person's reputation or track record. And so if you, if you have the right representative, okay. But otherwise, you know, you're yeah, going to be done to right. Okay. Kathleen, let's bring you in because you've worked with some pretty high profile it's, clients. It's an interesting challenge. It's an interesting challenge. A couple of things. Number one, I want to know, you know, is this uh, scientist weary, weary of his own company that they would not protect him in any capacity? Because that right off the bat, he should be aware of a crisis comm. So usually if somebody leaves that's disgruntled at a company, at least I know, I usually know. Oh, I was at JP Morgan, IBM. I was in Asia. I always knew because I created a very strong relationship with the head of HR and all the right people. So I would know if there was somebody who was kind of messing around. And I want that other scientist to feel good that we're protecting them. So, uh, you know, one of the things that I would probably ask them to do is reach out to your head of corporate communications, let them know that you're getting calls, that you have the right to call back, even if the, with the handbook, but you do want to make sure that you don't just go off and have, you know, the CEO of your company see you quoted an article that you, you know, they weren't anticipating. So I wouldn't hide under the desk. Absolutely not. I think you're right. At the same time, a good PR person could actually have him, have the spokesperson be the scientist. Like, hey, we're happy to have you speak to him, you know, directly. There's nothing to hide, right? Like there's no, you know, nothing to hide, right? Unfortunately, a lot of corporate communications would be like no comments, this kind of thing. And then, the, then there is that problem. So I think, you know, they have to go in and have, have their, like that story that, that it, what has happened, were they really associated? Why are mm. they getting phone calls to begin with? Like, what, what is the issue? Is mm. this guy just snooping around? Is he calling a million other people? Is he just getting paranoid and he thinks it's about him and it's not? And now you're making a bigger story than it is if he calls and he gets quoted. You know, he's getting associated with somebody who has let go for a reason, right? So I think the other thing is a good company can sit down, a PR person can sit down and look at this from a, a crisis calm situation and say, look, look, your reputation matters as well as the company's reputation in this situation. Let's make sure our standards are really clear. Let's make sure this journalist knows. Let's show facts and, and not just projections. And let's get on the phone with them sooner versus later so this we, we can so at least start to guide the article in some direction that's balanced. I think um, one of the problems, because I was actually speaking to this person on Reddit, and they weren't giving away many details, not surprisingly, because it was it was on a public forum. Yeah. And I, I think the biggest problem they had was that they were ju they just wanted to hide, you know. And you can't blame them; they were afraid. They didn't yeah. really know what might be brought up. They well, didn't know what accusations might be thrown at them. They I were just for afraid them. of this reporter who was trying yeah. to contact them. I feel bad that they, number one, don't know that they ha hopefully have a really strong corporate communications mm. team. It sounds like maybe they don't, or maybe they're not as senior as, and, and so for some reason, they don't realize that they have, they should have. Like when I was at IBM Research or anywhere like that, I always look to protect the individual as well as the company. You know, I'm working with Nobel Prize winners who are paranoid about people doing, you know, stealing their ideas on a regular basis. Like, you know, so it was not a, out of the, you know, it was, you know, trying to calm them down. Let's like, let me call the reporter and find out what is, what's the speculation. So you don't get blasted on the phone and feel like you have to respond right off the bat, because that's also not a great position to be in. And so the policy of the company too, I mean, does this scientist want to stay at his company? Because if you have a handbook that says, if you talk to the press without going through the proper channels, you're going to get in trouble. That's an issue. If you don't trust your company, then you might want to get a lawyer and and say, "Look, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna go off, you know, I'm gonna I'm not gonna I'm not getting I'm not getting the reaction from my PR team that I want, and so I feel like I'm gonna have to stand up for myself." And that's uh, a little bit different than what Jim is saying, but I feel like he's kind of taking if you take matters into your hand and don't follow the process, you know. You a good PR person is going to call back fast. They don't, because the company is also going to get slandered in this article. And so, so, the, so let's move important. it on because the other fear that they've got 
is, well, what if a story comes out? Now, okay, they don't know what the accusation is going to be, but what they're afraid of is that they're going to be accused of association. Not necessarily that their name is going to be said, you did something wrong, but just the fact that you're in a senior position. So what can they do to try and clean up after that? Well, it, well again, the, the, yeah. I think one of, the, one of the real strategic advantages of trying to gra- you know, g- grapple with this aggressively and openly from the get-go is that post-publication, it puts you in a much stronger position to stand tall in front of all the stakeholders and observers to the situation, your colleagues and other people who are aware of it, and say to them, listen, all along, from the time I was at the company till afterward to when I first learned of this story, until now, after publication, I've tried to stand tall, set the record straight, and steer a course of integrity. And contrast that, dear stakeholders, with the underhanded way that the journalist acted and the fact that the company won't, you know, explain themselves or, you know, with what my former colleague is saying, which is demonstrably untrue. I've been steering a course of integrity while all these other parties to it have been, you know, cutting corners. So, but how are you getting that message out there? How are you actually getting people to hear that? Because presumably that journalist is already going to... Now, when we work with individual executives or professional athletes, we create a, a, even a simple personal website with their name, you know, .com. And on there, it's got, you know, biographical information. But most importantly, on the homepage, it's got a, a public declaration. It could be an open letter. It could be an essay. It could be just a first-person exposition. Situations mm-hmm. arisen, I want to address it. Here's what I did. And you create that narrative about how you conducted yourself during the you know, period at issue and mm-hmm. since it came to scrutiny by uh, the, the press. Then social media, social media, you must, must, must take that material. And when the article appears, the publication is going to put it on social media. You put your reply right under there. This mm-hmm. is this mis- misleads readers about what happened here. Mm-hmm. I tried to confront the reporter. They wouldn't include these several facts. That's where you place it. And the reporter themselves is on their own personal social media is also going to be saying, oh, hey, look at, my, look at my snazzy new story. You jump right in there and say, hey, wait a second. Several of the things you wrote aren't so. Here's why. I demand an explanation. And if they want to engage and talk about what's accurate and what's not, great. Then you can set the record straight. And if they don't, that's another proof point that you can say, behold, dear stakeholders, I tried before, during, and after to set this reporter straight, and they're so determined to, you know, warp the frame that they don't have the integrity to engage in the conversation. That tells you all you need to know about their reliability. Yeah. So standing tall, yes, you're going to, you might take some slings and arrows, but it's a, at the end of the day, and we're talking about reputation here, you are signaling integrity. Yeah, I, I like, a- I like what you're saying. I think that most of the scientists that I've worked with, including my husband, who's, you know, you know, one of the original inventors of holographic video and um, PhD, have their own website. And a lot, and, and he's, he's not running around making lots of proclamations, but, you know, no matter where I lived, we were getting phone calls at, at, you know, about a paper he wrote or something, some invention that he did. And it's still happening, you know, wherever we go. And they're able to find him because that website is there, right? There, you know, and and it has every paper he's ever done, every patent he's ever had, right? So it's his 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 kind of page separate from anywhere else he ever works. And I do think that's a really, really smart. I I I would caution that the speed at which they start working with, you know, most companies have a crisis plan. This person is in a vacuum, and it's really sad that he's in a vacuum. He should go immediately to the corporate communications person and say, look, I need to respond to this. I need to respond in the next 24 hours. I've been hiding under a chair or a desk or wherever, which I shouldn't have been doing. And our company is going to be in this article as I I might be in this article. I think we need to get down to it. If I I'm happy to stand up for my what I've done, I'm happy to be a spokesperson with with your guidance as well, like right together. So we were able to say, you know, here's a uh, someone who works at the company and. Um, has you know worked here years and did sees no issue with the way we've been conducting business, and I think that's that's key. Also, he if he wants to stay at the company, that's the mm. way to go. If he doesn't want to stay at the company, he can call the reporter directly, and he may may get scolded, which would not which would be unfortunate. It, it it sounds a bit like I'm just doing a blatant plug here for PR and comms people, but I mean, if you were getting involved with this kind of client, and I, I mean their their business or whatever like that, I mean, how would you work with them? I mean, w- would they come to you for crisis communications help, or how would you actually work with them if they were coming to you? 
if they came directly, yeah, you, I would put recommendations together and I, I would call their corporate comms office because if we go off on a, on our own, unless he's been told, look, we're, we're not doing anything. We're going to say no comment. I would talk to him. I'd work with an, an attorney to make sure he's, he's protected and his right to go out and speak that he's been rejected in the corporate, by the corporate comms team, you know, that they're not going to protect him and he's going to get hung out to dry. We don't want that to happen. We're going to go more with what Jim is saying. We're going to go more that direct route as fast as possible. But I think that the, I, my, my first step, you know, suggestion is to try to work with the, with the company. Yeah. It's really um, interesting it, that I, I hadn't even thought about that, that they had kind of well, been left out. I mean, I, mean, I, I don't know the full details, of, but just on their own. Yeah. I mean, I can't even begin to tell you how many crazy stories I have of people. I'll give you an example. We, we, you know, I was running corporate communications for JP Morgan for across 18 countries. That's if it was during a four-way merger in Australia, we had somebody who decided to sue the Sydney Morning Herald without going to our attorney. And I had to fly, I flew to Australia a lot. Um, I seem to remember um, you telling me about this story. And by the way, Sydney Morning Herald is a very important publication to us. And by the yes. way, our head of communications, yes. her husband was the chief editor at the Sydney Morning Herald. So this was a quite an interesting situation at the time. <laughs> and it was years ago. So I feel comfortable. Yeah. But like we were able to get that, you know, I had to tell our attorneys like, hey, yeah. and it, it, it got messy fast, but I was I was able to clean it up and yeah. get back to where we needed to be and make nice. But it was. It, it caused a kerfuffle that was not needed. And yeah. had they followed the process, I would have gotten this, you know, fixed real quick. Yeah. The concern was a real valid concern. Something had been published in the City Morning Herald that people felt a little uncomfortable with. It was a conjecture about whether this person that was an analyst was talking to bankers when they shouldn't have been or had a bias. Mm -hmm. And I was able to get in there and show there is a wall there that is not happening. And you know, that was a bit of on the close to slander, what felt like slander. And so we were Do able to clear that, that up. Well, let's, let's round this up. So we're saying, first of all, is that you don't actually have an option to hide. It's just not something you can do. You've got to actually, you can't just sit there, hide from the journalist and hope it'll go away. Um, do we agree on that? Great. Yes. And I, I'd, yep. I'd only add, you know, the, the, the risk that you're going to be in the story, if the goal is make the story go away or minimize your portion of, of it, your best chance of doing that is making sure the editor and the, and the reporter know that if they color outside the lines, there's going to be quick, heavy consequences to their credibility. They can, they can be under no doubt that you're going to stand up, push back, fight hard. Yeah. So get clear on what the facts are, first of all. So, if, so be aware of the fact that you're going to have to say something. Get clear on what the facts are. Document what you did, your positive aspects to it as well. Get the company involved in it. Why aren't they helping you out already is kind of the question that we're wondering a little bit already. Do up your own sort of public declaration on your own website. And then, as you say, Jim, is making it clear to the journalist that, look, these are the facts. And if you get it wrong, I'm going to be... I'm and document the or whatever. the interaction with the journalist. Jim, that, that's your... That's your ammo and talk to me. That's very important. That's very important because you're already, it's you're already, absolutely. think about it. This is a journalist that is going on the lead of somebody who is already, was asked to leave the company and has a grudge. And the question is, are you going to have a balanced article or is this going to be just, you know, a gripe session? You're, are you trying yeah. to, you know, stir, stir stuff up or what's happening? This is absolutely fascinating. I cannot thank you both mm -hmm. enough as usual on this show. I love the fact we get to discuss these issues and get, the sort of mix of ideas as well, because it's so interesting as everyone bounces off each other. Please say again who you are again and how people can get hold of you if they would like to get in contact. So start with Kathleen. I'm Kathleen Lucente. I'm the CEO and founder of Red Fan Communications. We're based in Austin, Texas. You can find me on LinkedIn at Kathleen Lucente, or you can find me at redfancommunications.com. Jim. And I'm Jim McCarthy, president of Counterpoint Strategies, a boutique crisis management firm in New York City. And you can reach me through my Twitter handle, jmacnyc. And we'll get all those details on the screen and on the website as well. I hope you found this show useful today. Now, those scenarios may not be exactly what you are experiencing yourself, but I think you can hear there's so much of the strategies 
that can be applied across the board. And you can hear about the power and the effectiveness of what comms and PR today can be doing for your organization or for your business. If you would like to get in touch with my guests, as I say, you can reach out to them on the website. And don't forget to listen in to comms question time again. If you've got a scenario as well, reach out to us and let us know about that so that we can discuss that and get the message out there about how powerful and how useful this field is in the modern era of marketing and communications. Speak to you very soon.